So welcome to the webinar on COVID-19 and stroke, a perspective from the Asia Pacific. It's 5 p.m. in Melbourne, Australia, 4 p.m. in Tokyo, Japan, and 3 p.m. in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. I'm Carmen Leif Jenkins, Managing Editor of the International Journal of Stroke and Project Manager for the World Stroke Academy. If you're on Twitter, our hashtags are at worldstrokeorg and intjstroke, so I-N-T-J-stroke. And we are supported by the BI Angels in Southeast Asia with this webinar today. So this session runs for an hour and will be recorded and hosted on the World Stroke Organization website and our YouTube channel. After this brief presentation from this excellent group of researchers and clinicians, we will have a Q&A hosted by Dr. Monica Sani from the Department of Medicine and Neurology at Changi General Hospital in Singapore. If you want to add to the Q&A, and please do so, using the Q&A function, not the chat function, and please do add your questions questions during the talk rather than all at once at the end. So we will start today with Professor um, Teriyuki Hirano and the topic late or non presentation of stroke during COVID. Please do go ahead. Thank you, Chairman. My task today is talk about this topic that is late or non presentation of stroke during COVID-19 pandemic. This is my disclosure. Okay, now, this slide shows a daily report of new COVID-19 patients in Japan. The number of patients increased from late March. The first wave of infection seems to have lasted in mid-May. The cumulative number is 70,200. During the first wave, Japanese government declared state of emergency over coronavirus on April. No legal force was accompanied. People were asked to stay at their home. So what happened to the number of stroke patient admission? This is a short summary of the number of ischemic stroke and TIA patients from January to May. This line shows total number of ischemic stroke patients in 2019, and this is 2020. Total number declined from April to May. However, regarding the number of patients who were treated with mechanical thrombectomy remained the same between 2019 and 2020. This means severe ischemic stroke patient as well as hemorrhagic stroke did not decrease during COVID pandemic. What was decreased is admission of mild stroke and TIA. This data is originated from 33 stroke centers participating Japan Society of Vascular and Interventional Neurology, JASVIM. This phenomenon raises the question did stroke patients disappear during COVID-19 pandemic? Nobody knows the right answer, but three scenario comes up on top of my head. First, stay at home campaign might result in decreasing stroke incidence. Less work, less drinking, healthy diet may lead to a better lifestyle. But the biggest reason is the fear of admission. Stroke patient hesitates to go hospital where the coronavirus is concentrated. The other thing I need to mention is the overload of emergency room or ICU. A lot of facilities shifted their stroke resource to act against COVID-19. Staffs and beds could not be secured to stroke triage. To overcome patients' fear of admission, the Japan Stroke Association kept providing accurate information on the web. Sorry, these were made in Japanese. The questions are, does coronavirus cause stroke? I have fear of being infected at hospital. What should I tell to the EMS staff? And uh, does stroke emergency service remain as usual? 
JSA prepares the answers as accurate as possible and have the issuing message act fast. Now, I will show you my patient who came to our stroke center during COVID pandemic. This 79-year-old lady had a history of brain contusion, as you see on her left. Modified ranking was three and mini mental state scored nine. She collapsed at midnight, called 119 and ambulance arrived. EMS asked two stroke centers to accept but both were busy to treat COVID patient. Her newly developed her left hemiparesis was masked by her previous disabilities. So EMS was not confident of stroke and patient's family expressed fear of coronavirus infection. Therefore, she decided to stay at home. I learned two things from this patient. First, once you suspect stroke, don't stay at home. We need to dispel the fear of coronavirus infection. Second, we need to secure our stroke resource to accept stroke patients. Our problem is this, to overcome shortage of stroke resource. On 11th of May, Japan Stroke Society conducted a questionnaire whether primary stroke centers are capable of accepting emergent patients with stroke. More than 20% of JSS certified PSC forced to limit their stroke acceptance because of the shortage of various resources. The reason is quite simple. The greater the number of COVID-19 patients, the higher the medical treatment restriction rate. This graph shows the relation between cumulative number of COVID-19 patients in each prefectures in Japan and percentage of facilities that cannot handle stroke emergency as usual. You can see positive correlation. Therefore, it is essential not to increase the number of COVID-19 patients in order to maintain emergency medical care. In summary, during COVID-19 pandemic in Japan, number of mild stroke or TIA decreased during COVID-19 pandemic. Stay at home campaign resulted in better lifestyle, less work, presumably less drinking, sedentary zone, which reduced incidence of stroke. Patients fear of coronavirus infection prohibited early arrival shortage of stroke service due to resource shift to COVID-19. Final message of my talk today, controlling incidence of new COVID-19 is essential. And for the patient, we need to keep issuing the message, stroke, don't stay at home. Thank you for attention. Just before we go ahead, um, I just have to say that Professor Hirano is a stroke neurologist and director of the Stroke Centre at the Kyurin, Kyurin University Hospital in Tokyo, Japan. He's an active board member of the World Stroke Organization and acting chairperson of the International Committee of the Japan Stroke Society. And he's also um, currently in charge of the anti-COVID project of the Japan Stroke Society. Professor Hirano, thank you so much for that. I do apologize, it was a bit unclear, but that certainly wasn't your fault. And hopefully the internet will be better when we do the Q&A. Okay. So I'll just move to the next um, panelist for today. Please everyone, don't forget um, to add your questions to the Q&A and function during the talk. Uh, this webinar is hosted by the World Stroke Organization and supported by the VI Angels in Southeast Asia. Uh, next is Dr. Wan Ashraf Wanzaidi, who is um, on the topic, talking on the topic of change and challenges to hyperacute management. Uh, his Twitter handle, if you'd like to follow him, we'll pop it in the chat, but it's also at Dr. Ashraf, so A-S-Y-R-A-F. 
Uh, Dr. Um, Ashraf Wan Zaidi is a consultant physician and stroke neurologist at the Hospital University um, Kebang Musan in Malaysia. He is currently the Vice President of Malaysia Stroke Council and an active stroke researcher in acute stroke, stroke prevention and rehabilitation, including avert dose in Malaysia. Ashraf, please do go ahead. Okay, thank you for the kind introduction. So uh, my name is Ashraf and I'm one of the strong neurologists as mentioned and our hospital uh, name is Hospital Chancellor Tuanku Mukrit or Hospital UKM and uh, basically I would like to thank World Stroke Organization again and the World Stroke Academy for uh, inviting uh, me and also on behalf of Malaysia to basically share the change and challenges to hyperacute management during this COVID-19. So before I begin, so basically uh, the uh, hospital in Bahasa Malaysia is also known as Pusat Prabata University Kebangsaan Malaysia. It's basically located in the Kuala Lumpur itself. And uh, as you can see over here, in the uh, picture on the right upper part, so uh, till yesterday, 8,329 people is infected in Malaysia with COVID-19. And fortunately, as for yesterday, for the first time, we, uh, the Director General of Health announced that only seven new cases detected yes, uh, yesterday. And unfortunately, uh, already about 117 patients succumbed due to, due to this COVID-19. As you can see, uh, the hospital is located in Kuala Lumpur, and this is also within the surroundings of Selangor, another state which is heavily in fact, uh, affected by the COVID-19. And uh, the hospital itself is a hybrid hospital for COVID-19, meaning we entertain both COVID-19 and non-COVID-19 patients. So uh, as uh, been mentioned by Click before, so you know that there will be implication to the stroke services. So on the 18th of March, 2020, uh, our government decided to uh, uh, start the movement control order. And since then, there's uh, uh, things that happen and I'll share later on. So today, I would like to uh, discuss about the survey that we did with the collaboration of, uh, with our uh, Angels Initiative Malaysia. And uh, we uh, basically had the luxury to uh, to basically get uh, the response from 47 neurologists and physicians in Malaysia. And uh, what I want to show from these slides, basically, this is covering the whole uh, Malaysia from the peninsula Malaysia and up to the East Malaysia, Sabah and Sarawak. So uh, just uh, to share with everyone, the 47 neurologists actually uh, called uh, provide stroke thrombolysis service in Malaysia, the uh, stroke thrombectomy service is very much limited still. So uh, we will discuss along the line of stroke reperfusion therapy, mostly about thrombolysis. But uh, our, my hospital here, Hospital University of Sikmasa in Malaysia, uh, also provides stroke thrombectomy, and uh, we will see what is the implication afterwards. So uh, I would discuss about hyperacute uh, stroke and acute stroke treatment. And you, as you can see from the respondent here, almost 60%, 57.45% respondents agree that there is uh, implications on the acute treatment. And the next uh, stroke service which is affected is stroke rehabilitation, which will be discussed by Katija afterwards. Okay, so which part of acute stroke treatment is basically uh, affected in Malaysia during this COVID-19 according to these physicians? So you can see for the stroke admission here, cumulative 25% uh, to more than 50% uh, called admission reduction, according to respondents, 60% of the respondents says that there is more than 25% to 50% reduction. So this 66%, sorry. So this is uh, quite alarming. And you go to the stroke reperfusion uh, treatment, intravenous thrombolysis, there uh, about 40% uh, physicians agree that there's reduction of more than 50% intravenous thrombolysis treatment during this COVID-19 pandemic. And this survey is being done within the initial part of the MCO. So this is uh, from 18th of March to end of uh, April. We, so this is a market uh, called reductions of uh, hyperacute stroke service uh, during this time around. So, uh, from this point, I would like to discuss along these four points. So what happened to the hyperacute stroke service? First point is about triaging, the PPE, the personnel protective equipment, healthcare staff, and also stroke at a unit admission, also the specialty or intensive care unit admission. So this is one of the initial prototype questionnaire that being used as a triage uh, questionnaire in the emergency department. 
So as you can see from here, the outcome is basically in HUKM, for example, we have respiratory and non-respiratory zone. What is the implication to the stroke service? It's basically there's a delay when the patient being triaged to the respiratory zone, then uh, the, there's a, a bit more preparation and also a bit more stigma uh, for the, the team to go in. So uh, that's, that's the problem now. So the, there's a longer uh, door to, to review uh, with the neurology also with my registrar at the, the initial part of the COVID-19 pandemic. And this is expected. And uh, the next one will be the new normal. So you can see over here, so the, uh, the PPE required when you entertain the coat stroke is basically you need to have the head cover and your face shield, you have the surgical mask and the, called the disposable uh, gown and also the surgical uh, called uh, takes everything here. And this basically, uh, on its own, if you want to prepare for this, this will take more than five minutes. And again, difficult for us to achieve the door to needle time of 60 minutes with this kind of preparation. And you know that we need to basically preserve on this uh, PPE requirements. So we don't want to waste the PPEs. So previously uh, in HUKM, we can go down with one consultant and few medical officers, one registrar and maybe another fellow because of we are one of the training center for stroke reperfusion. However, because of this COVID-19, only one registrar or fellow will come together with a stroke consultants, uh, neurologists at the same time. So two people maximum during the code stroke. And for the healthcare staff and stroke uh, unit admission, the healthcare staff as usual, any part of the world and um, in Malaysia, so there's redeployment or restructuring of the, the, the wards uh, for admission, to cater the admission for COVID-19. So similarly in our intensive care unit, so uh, the, the services is much more uh, called concentrated on the services to, to, to COVID-19 initially. Afterwards, when we already noticed that we need to entertain both COVID-19 and non-COVID-19, so we started to develop a system that uh, uh, called, uh, at least we can triage them from one uh, SARI area to the non-SARI ICU. So uh, just to mention over here, the neurologists uh, uh, in HUKM, including me, but uh, specifically uh, to my own boss, uh, Prof. Nafisa, she's also in charge of uh, COVID-19. So she's a COVID-19 physician. All of us in HUKM also do the, the internal medicine rotation uh, at least two months in the year uh, to, for, uh, for, the, uh, for the ward uh, in charge. And uh, we also do monthly on-call. So we still do internal medicine, okay? So for, for my hospital itself, stroke care unit uh, is not affected. That's fortunate for us as uh, we are one of the initial uh, called the, the pioneer of stroke services with stroke care unit. So we are very lucky with that. So what I want to show over here is basically uh, stroke reperfusion treatment. We are blessed in HUKM to uh, have the, the multimodal imaging, stroke reperfusion imaging. And fortunately, after the publication by Henry Maithal, Bruce Campbell, and I, my, me myself went to Royal Melbourne and we learned about this and uh, we able to utilize the perfusion in our center. So what happened for the stroke reperfusion treatment is uh, for the first two weeks or three weeks, uh, we don't have uh, much uh, code stroke activation. And uh, obviously then the, there's no uh, intravenous thrombolysis. After the third week, the numbers start to recover. So we usually have one to two week, uh, one to two uh, called intravenous thrombolysis in a week. And uh, this is already recovering and uh, we start to see LVOs as usual. However, we don't have uh, negative pressure room available and the initial part of COVID-19 screening, everything is, uh, is really affecting the thrombectomy service. As you can see here, there's no thrombectomy since the MCO till today. So uh, what we do with the, with the experience with CT perfusions, we actually try to venture into extend uh, trial criteria for treatment. So far, we are doing so good with this one. Okay, so what I want to share today, so from the stroke council part as uh, experts, uh, uh, as you can see also in the World Stroke Organization uh, called websites. So uh, similarly, we want to give the same message to the, all physicians that provide the stroke service. We should continue the service. This is evidence-based and this is very important for all our patients, including COVID and non-COVID patients. So this is my last slide. So COVID-19, although is a, is a, 
is actually a new thing for us and obviously all of us are in initially a bit shocked and a bit scared of uh, providing the service. You see, at the same time, this is also a good thing for us where you can see it act as a catalyst to a new frontier. So as I mentioned here, the future is now. So you can see the telemedicine services start to, to, to basically uh, be implemented. Even in, in our hospital now, there's a discussion to, to, to try to start the service. And uh, me, myself, is involved uh, with the idea of starting the new fast track TIA clinic. We won this before, and now we start to, to, to develop this a bit faster. And the good news that we have last week, basically, uh, we just launched, uh, we just had our remote uh, site, initial, site initiation meeting uh, for the avert dose trial. And we are very enthusiastic to start this, uh, this uh, clinical trial soon. And as uh, any ac academician and uh, with Stroke Council, basically, we encourage further study related to COVID-19 and non-COVID-19 stroke. So as new change and new development, so we will also uh, do our first virtual Malaysia Soap Conference in August. So I welcome all of you to join and uh, you can uh, visit our websites to participate in this conference. And last but not least here, you can, uh, you can contact me later uh, through uh, my email here. And just to show the new normal over here. So you see uh, social distance, wearing surgical masks, so basically, this is the part of the overdose. It's not the whole overdose uh, team. So this is just recently last week. So we are very, very in, uh, called, uh, I'm called, uh, lucky to have a very big team and we should be able to do more for the stroke patients. And last but uh, over here on the right, uh, lower down here, basically the Stroke Council and National uh, Stroke uh, Workflow uh, Steering Committee and also ANGELS. We thank, uh, again, World Stroke Organization for giving the opportunity to share our experience. Back to you, Carmen. Thank you. Ashraf, thank you so much. That was excellent. Um, so please don't forget uh, to add your questions to the Q&A function during this talk. The webinar is hosted by the World Stroke Organization and supported by BR Angels in Southeast Asia. Dr. Sahathavan is a consultant physician and neurologist with the Ballarat Health Services in Australia. He has clinical practice and research interest in acute stroke care, stroke prevention, and cognitive disorders in stroke. He's currently vice chair of the WSO Education Committee, a member of the Lancet Committee on, Committee on Stroke in low middle income countries, a member of the Global Burden of Disease Network, and a faculty member of the Lundberg, Lundbeck International Neuroscience Foundation, uh, and many other Things. I've known Ramesh for a long time. I'm very pleased to hand this over to you, Ramesh. Thank you so much for stepping up during our internet. Um, firstly, I'd like to thank Carmen for organizing this, and I'd like to thank Monica uh, Saini for moderating the session. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to give you a quick outline of what my talk's going to be about. So I'll speak about COVID and where we are now then address acute stroke services, inpatient services, outpatient services, where I am specifically, and then talk to you in terms of what we are keeping, hopefully, at the end of all of this. COVID's something that, you know, it's, it's unprecedented. I know that's been used so many times that it's quite boring, but unfortunately, that's what it is. Um, as of the 8th of June at 11 a.m. Melbourne time, there were almost 7 million cases worldwide with 400,000 deaths. This is, of course, increasing day on day. We've done fairly well in Australia, thank God, in the state of Victoria. There have only been 19 deaths and there have been um, 12 cases here in my hospital. So where is my hospital? I work for something called the Ballarat Health Services, and uh, it's the main referral uh, hospital for a large area known as the Grampians region of Western Victoria. Uh, this is a catchment of 250,000 people and covers an area of 48,000 square kilometers. The hospital has been sort of COVID prepared since March. What have we been forced to change because of that. And as I said, I'm go, going to cover this in terms of acute stroke services, inpatient services, and outpatient services. 
have we seen a drop in a huge stroke? Yes, we have. Um, my colleague, Casey Hare, who is um, the site coordinator for the Victorian Stroke Telemedicine or VST service, put this together. So thanks, Casey. And um, what Casey's sort of found is that we've seen a sort of a drop across all of the major, major parts of our service. So in terms of code strokes, um, patients who are brought into the ED uh, as an acute stroke are immediately put onto a code stroke pathway. In terms of the inpatient stroke calls, in terms of thrombolysis, in terms of ECR. Our acute stroke treatment is provided by a combination. So we've got neurologists here at the Ballarat Base Hospital, but we only serve during hours. After hours, we rely on the neurologists of the Victorian Stroke Telemedicine Service, which Chris Bladen and Dom Cadillac spoke about a few weeks ago. In addition, we also use something called Pulsara, which is a mobile application, and this allows pre-notification. And so you have one platform communi communication uh, that is streamed and that is real time. And this is activated usually by the paramedics. We can thrombolize patients here, but that's where it stops. We do not have ECR capability. So patients who are to be um, sent down an ECR pathway are then put into an ambulance and transferred down to Royal Melbourne Hospital. We've changed things by first reducing the number of people who attend an acute stroke call from our side in the ED. The number of people would vary from four to five, and now it's down to two. Once we started finding out that there were more manifestations of neurology in terms of COVID-19, we actually got in touch with the ED, and we said to them, look, these are the other things that you might be needing to look out for. We also explored whether Pulsara could be expanded in terms of being used to pre-notify if COVID patients were coming in. The interesting thing is that my first uh, notification, so to speak, of the neurological manifestations of COVID uh, didn't come from a journal. It didn't come through my email. I actually learned about it on Twitter. There have been no COVID-related strokes, thank God, here in BHS, but we are in a way prepared for it. Inpatient services have been affected as well. And firstly, uh, I'd like to talk about an inpatient stroke alert. So we had no formalized protocol for assessment of management of patients who unfortunately had a stroke while they were already in hospital for something else. Um, in 2019, there were 29 inpatient strokes, and we've looked at our data going back to about 2015, and there's been a sort of year-on-year -year increase. Because of this, um, we looked at an inpatient stroke alert that was drafted in 2017, and then unfortunately sat in committee because we had a little trouble getting all of the stakeholders on board and agreeing to what we had suggested. This document was drawn up again with the help of Casey Hare. Uh, and now, finally, I think because of what's going on, it's been approved. Inpatient services um, were also changed in relation to our multidisciplinary team meeting. So we had three meetings weekly, and this included 10 to 12 members across the spectrum. So neurologists, um, the resident, the registrar, um, our stroke nurse, um, our de facto stroke nurse, I should say, who was also Casey Hare, and members of the LR health team, social workers. We could not sustain this because of the poor social distancing in the physical space. So the idea was then that we would use Zoom for the meeting, and the members of the team then set up a WhatsApp group that let them to be able to discuss uh, patients. Um, who required, say, further care even after the meeting. And we've actually had a really good response from all of the users. Because of COVID patients possibly requiring ICU care, we had to look at whether the patients could then be looked after 
on the ward in the event of thrombolysis. And again, this was um, initiative from the staff, the nurses on the ward, um, who then said, okay, look, let's just put this together. And so they identified a space. They made sure that we had the monitoring equipment that was required and requisitioned it from other parts of the hospital. And uh, they then looked for training uh, amongst themselves. And again, Casey was instrumental in this, along with Vicky Thomas, who was the, uh, who's the nurse in charge of the ward. Uh, protocols were adapted, and we now stand ready to be able to treat or care for, rather, any patient who has had thrombolysis on our ward. Our outpatient service has also been affected. So initially, we were told that outpatient service would have, would, services would have to be cut back. Um, and we argued that there was already quite a waiting list, and so we elected to continue. The one thing that has been affected is, of course, our nerve conduction studies and EMGs, and this should come as no surprise um, because of the sort of close proximity um, that would have to be maintained between the assessor and the patient. So this has been held off until further notice. However, we've still been able to see about 90% of our patients either over the phone or by video conferencing. We also have um, one of us, one of the consultants, looking at the patients who are due to be seen in the resident and registrar-run clinic. We then run through the paperwork, formulate a plan which is put onto the patient's record on their electronic um, medical record and uh, the registrar or resident then has a plan in terms of what needs to be done. The platform that's being used is something called Health Direct and this is funded by the state government uh, through the Medicare benefits schedule for both phone and teleconferencing. Now I run my own sort of private rooms as well and for that I'm using something called DocSeeMe. It's available online. I suggest that um, anyone who's interested in that, look at it. I will though caution and say that, you know, if you're setting up a service, it's worthwhile looking at first in terms of what the words actually mean. Um, because Doxy, unfortunately, has a, a slightly um, colored connotation, shall I say, uh, and I've alluded to it in this painting by Degas. So what are the things that we're going to keep? The inpatient stroke in alert um, was designed even before the COVID thing, but we are definitely going to be keeping this on. Uh, the next would be uh, Zoom and WhatsApp platform for the multidisciplinary team meeting. As I said, we have three meetings a week, so two of them are going to go on to a virtual um, meeting room, and we will keep one meeting for face-to-face. -face. We are definitely going to be looking at keeping um, post-thrombolysis care on the neurology ward. And we're definitely going to try and develop further uh, teleconferencing and phone service for our outpatients. It's a very scary world that we're now in. And this has proved a huge challenge, but I think mostly we've been able to actually meet these challenges quite well. Even though COVID-19 is a major, is, is primarily rather a respiratory condition, we obviously know that neurological manifestations are becoming more and more obvious. And this has affected the way that we run our service. Monica Saini actually put something up on, on Twitter some time ago. I've not been able to find it. Um, but the question was that, look, we are in a position now to look at our service and look to see how we can improve it. There is something positive that needs to come out of this whole negative situation which we find ourselves in. And I will leave you with a question in terms of, are we prepared or are we now going to be better prepared, I should say, for the next COVID? Um, and with that, I thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Ramesh. Um, so we're now going to speak to Dr. Khadiji um, Muhammad Ali, who will speak on the topic of ensuring access to allied health services. Um, so you're a senior principal physiotherapist at Hospital Councillor Tunka 
at Muriz, which is HTCM in Malaysia and an honorary clinical associate at Swinburne University of Technology in Australia. Uh, so Dr. Kadaji Muhammad Ali has over 25 years of clinical experience with expertise in both neurological and cardiorespiratory physiotherapy and published papers in both areas. She has 10 years experience managing allied health services in HTCM and is an active stroke researcher in acute stroke rehabilitation in Malaysia and an important contributor to the AVERT trial as well. Uh, thank you for having me here today to talk on uh, the title Ensuring Access to LR Health Services During COVID-19 UKM Experience. Next. Um, the content of my presentation will be as follows. LR Health Services at Hospital Chancellor Tuan Kum in Kuala Lumpur. Next, I will talk about normal activity related to stroke, situation and approach during pandemic, lesson learned and recommendation for the benefit of others. At my hospital, rehab team consists of physiotherapy, occupational therapy, speech language pathology, audiologists, and prosthetic and orthotic services. This is based on reference system. The outpatient to inpatient services stand at a ratio of 62 to 38%. We define our inpatient rehab as a service delivered in a hospital setting. West Community Rehab is a service delivered deliver in outpatient or in the patient's own home. These models include early supported discharge from acute hospital. Prior to patient discharge, a family meeting will be conducted with MBT approach along the care and support the, in the home after discharge. However, this is based on certain criteria for inclusion. Under normal circumstances, inpatient rehab had a mean length of stay of four to five days. Most of our patients went home. However, 40% have no further rehabilitation. And I think this figure is under reporting. And to make matter worse, the Malaysian Clinical Practice Guideline for Stroke do not address care beyond the acute care stroke unit. And there's also no current protocol specifically address the transfer of care for long-term stroke management at community level. At the hospital, we have no inpatient rehabilitation. There are several reasons why this happened. Everything and personal observation is telling us that there is a lack of awareness among physicians regarding the role of neuro rehabilitation. There's also a lack of coordination of post-stroke beyond the acute phase. And we, there's, uh, uh, there are some of our patients declare referral for outpatient rehabilitation because of caregiver related issues or because of cost in care. And there are some obviously patients who are not eligible for our local rehabilitation services. So what happened during pandemic time? We are categorized as essential services under the Ministry of Health as per standard operating procedures, but not by the National Security Council. As a result, our outpatient services were stopped from 18 March under the movement control order. So our outpatient therapist has been redeployed to the ward. And at, during this time, we are working at 36 to 56% staffing, which varies between disciplines on a rotational basis of normal services. We also created unofficial temporary standby response position for COVID-19 cases in ICU. We resumed the outpatient service on the 1st June under the condition movement control order. In terms of our patient management, negative patients were treated as per usual care in inpatient setting. For patients with positive COVID and person under investigation as per standard operating for airborne and droplets precaution, we are required to ensure strict social distancing and use of advanced personal protective equipment to minimize the risk of COVID-19 transmission. We are fortunate that there has never been a case for COVID stroke in the hospital, but the impact is still significant to our air health services. <coughs> in this situation, we saw more than 48 to 99% of our patient workload drops in our patient. The main workload is shifted to inpatient services. However, even numbers of inpatients seeking treatment also dropped by 20 to 47%. Our new norm for outpatient service varies across unit and discipline. For example, the new norm for physiotherapy is at three patients per discipline. Similar like inpatient standard uh, PPE is used on outpatient during screening and also treatment. At this time, <clears throat> There is minimal remote consultation via what's called initiated by the physio and opinion therapist. The therapist is required to develop patient education videos. 
for through specifically for example we develop education video on passive and trans active transfer technique solving strategies activity of daily living this is to be uploaded later on social media however during this period we realized that allied health services was excluded in the telemedicine act and only physician is allowed to conduct telemedicine this is another of our limitation for allied health profession we are we are not allowed to produce any related telehealth material without proper approval from our hospital management. <clears throat> this is a snapshot of the total number of cases for 2020 in comparison to last year on our outpatient service. Naturally, as you can see, the trend is expected to reduce from March to April. For stroke, especially for stroke, we found that almost 60% drop in new referral and 80% in repeated session. <clears throat> Likewise, for inpatient, as you can see, a downward trend for total number of cases between March to April compared to last year. However, interestingly, for stroke, there's an increase in new referral to 42%. We hypothesize that because of less workload, clinicians have more time to refer cases to us, but still there is a reduction on repeated cases at 26%. Recent survey among the neurologists reported that 66% agreed that rehabilitation function is the most severely affected during this time, which is consistent with what our data is indica indicating. So the Malaysian Stroke Council emphasized the importance of telehealth rehabilitation as this will hasten patient recovery. So even under normal circumstances, our patients are unable to assess post-stroke rehab. And COVID-19 and with COVID-19 is more severely affected. So stroke is an emergency situation and the faster the patient receives rehabilitation, the better the outcome. And my recommendation is telehealth is very important. No doubt face-to-face -face therapy cannot be replaced by telehealth, but this will be our new norm and exist and assist 40% for those who is deprived of rehabilitation even before COVID-19. And within HR, our hospital, we need full support from relevant authority to initiate telehealth program for the benefit of our patient. The Malaysian Tenure Medicine Act 1997 need to updating to include ELA Health Services. There's also urgency to update the Malaysian Stroke CPG Guideline and Transport Care Protocol to include ELA Health Services with best practice model of care in, in, in order to improve access to ELA Health Services in acute and a community. Lastly, I think clinical research is important as there's a gap and lack of tension on early rehabilitation from hyperacute to community. And with that, I concluded my talk. Thank you for your attention. Kadija, thank you so much. You were very, very good to be quite quick so that we've got some time for our discussion today. So we've only got 10 minutes left, unfortunately. And at this point, I'm going to hand over to Dr. Monica Sani, who's going to run our Q&A. Monica, would you mind taking over from this point? And I'll see you at the very end um, when we're finished. Fantastic speakers there. Um, and I we do hear. have some questions. And I think um, what I'll do is I'll, I'll post some questions for everyone. I think what we've been hearing is something which, we, uh, which I heard from the Europeans, from the Americans, from the Indians. Um, I actually have moderated some other sessions and it's very interesting. And this is for uh, Dr. Hirano, Dr. Ashraf, as well as uh, Ramesh. You know, we're not seeing the kind of strokes that the West has seen. Um, you know, they're talking about the uh, large artery strokes, uh, very bad uh, coagulopathies. And for some reason, uh, the East is absolutely sped. Do you agree with me? What has your experience been, um, Ramesh? I'll, I'll have to say that my experience has been armchair. Thankfully, we've not seen any COVID-related stroke in, in my, my center. Now, look, I think that there are definitely cases that have been in, in the literature. There are case reports. There are the reports coming out of the US. So I think the whole cytokine inflammatory response prothrombotic state is definitely something that we we'd have to look at. Uh, the concern, of course, on my part is how would we greet, how, how would we deal with those sorts of patients? Are they patients that you're going to be brave enough to thrombolize? And I think it'd be a slightly brave neurologist who takes that position. 
or are we going to say no this person goes immediately for ecr so uh, we will have to wait i think for the information to come up i i don't know what um terry and and uh, ashraf think okay uh from japan we have surveillance about the COVID-19 related stroke, but fortunately, I have not heard about the COVID related stroke uh, to date. Maybe the number of COVID-19 patients is not so large enough to experience the COVID related stroke. So we need to keep eye on to the uh, presence of the COVID related uh, coagulopathy or the large artery inflammation. So we need to keep watching what happens. Ashraf, what about you? And one of the, band, uh, one of the uh, participants actually wanted to know whether reperfusion uh, is available throughout Malaysia. So would you like to answer that as well? So, okay, so for the first uh, point just now, I think agree uh, with Ramesh and so Prof. Tariki. So uh, I think we need to, uh, to check back on our patients and basically we try to, uh, to, to do a study back whether we miss the patient because of uh, the basic, uh, you can see from the first paper from the Wuhan team. So uh, the, the stroke patient mainly happened in the more severe subform. So maybe within the 117 patient that we have, then we need to check back on that. So maybe we have more and uh, we, we will have more data soon, hopefully. And the mild form, they rarely uh, stroke out. And uh, for the question about the stroke reperfusion treatment, so most of the, the uh, just to share with you, uh, with the benefit of uh, ANGEL's uh, uh, initiative collaboration, uh, when uh, back 2016, we only have about seven uh, uh, called uh, intravenous thrombolysis center, which is capable to, 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 to uh, provide the service. But now we have more than 50 centers in 2020. So, and uh, I think we have almost the same number of the uh, previous center for EVTs, which is about seven, but mostly uh, private and uh, also the, the uh, public university. So we have few other public center, for example, Hospital Kuala Lumpur and Hospital Sungai Buloh. So uh, very much limited still for the endovascular thrombectomy. Therefore, I think we still need to have uh, much more collaboration, uh, maybe striker and also with other, other team, yeah. Uh, and that's an interesting point you brought up um, about, you know, collating data and then finding out what really happened. Um, how has research been, how has stroke-related research been at all your centers? Um, um, my question is to all the speakers, in fact. I think all of you are running some studies. So maybe um, we start with Ramesh. Again, um, smaller hospital. We've been able to continue on with the small projects that we are running. Uh, and these are mostly observational studies. All of our multi-center trials actually thankfully ended before COVID started. So those were nicely wrapped up. We've not started anything new, but in a way, I guess, you know, it's given me now time to sit down with the others and say, let's plan. So we've got plans put in place and the proposals are being written because we have a little more spare time. Uh, and we've been told essentially that, look, don't think that anything is going to be approved at this point. Um, that that would be my my two cents worth. Um, Dr. Hirano, how's research been at your center? Yes, in Japan, the new project is postponed because of the COVID pandemic, but the, some uh, research is still ongoing, uh, such as uh, uh, cell therapy for the ischemic stroke in Japan, but the newly uh, projected are not. Uh, started yet. And we are now planning to restart our research. And regarding the COVID-19 and stroke relationship, the Japan Stroke Society is now planning to have a survey for all the stroke centers in Japan. And uh, we will uh, find out the relation between the COVID-19 and the uh, ischemic stroke or hemorrhagic stroke. So that is our newly projected plan. Katisha, you've been running some studies as well, right? Uh, we, were, we have, uh, in terms of our study, I mean, I'm just focusing on uh, over those trial. 
So, but we actually have an ethics approval early. That was last year, but because of the initiation training, because of COVID nineteen, so the training has been suspended, and our recruitment also has been suspended. <laughs> so that's why we we just started our initiation training last week. We are online, and we we will soon recruit our first patient. Maybe one in one or two weeks time. Yeah. Uh, one of the participants had a question for you: uh, whether you have any recommendations for tele rehab. Um, is, are you looking into bringing up some kind of uh, protocols or uh, standardizing how tele rehab is going to work at your centers? Well, um, I mean, I'm I'm looking at uh, because of of the ex our experience designing the uh, with the Everett Central, we designed a protocol for hyper acute uh, hyper acute um, hyper acute management. So I'm thinking that uh, my recommendation is that probably I mean the the telehealth we will stratify patients according to the NHS scores or modified ranking skills and all of uh, functional mobility score from mild moderate to severity and we categorize those patients put them in a group around the classes ten to two uh, ten to I mean depends huh? So, uh, but the details needs to be, I mean, standardized and we have to test the, the effectiveness and see the outcomes uh, in three months time, looking at the windows of recovery at three, three months or six months. So that will be our pilot, the next step of the project for telehealth. I mean, that's my recommendations. Yeah. So this is something that you're going to have to be working at. Uh, yes, yes, yeah. We need yeah. to work out the details. Uh. Dr. Ashraf, uh, you know, you, you uh, showed us the guidelines that you've come up with for stroke management in Malaysia. I was just wondering whether, you know, you could divide those guidelines based on what kind of facilities each hospital is working at, where you have thrombolysis, you have thrombectomy, and where you have neither, and whether you're going to be incorporating telehealth into it. Okay, so uh, basically, uh, because of some of the centers is uh, very limited in terms of the healthcare staff, everything, so there's a bit of heterogeneity in terms of one center to one center. So the guidelines is a bit uh, called general, and uh, we, uh, as I mentioned just now, the message is very clear that we want to make sure the service should continue, and uh, we don't want people to to be panic, and don't want to provide the service. So uh, 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 the next step will be, as you mentioned, uh, we, we will try to, to then get uh, called those centers and we try to advise them. This is through the major stroke councils and also the, the steering committee. So we provide such uh, called advice. So uh, from uh, one center to one center, there will be a bit different. So that's a bit, uh, that's uh, the, the things that are uh, happening in Malaysia. Yeah. Okay, I'm being uh, told that we don't have time, but this is a question that I'd really like to ask, you know, um, Ashraf used the term new frontier, and uh, Ramesh mentioned next COVID. I don't think we want the next COVID, but we do want to be ready for anything that comes next. So my question to all of you is, what are the silver linings that you've seen in this horrible disaster? You know, um, how is it taking us forward? Has it fast-tracked certain developments that you think are positive? And I'll um, start from the north. Um, uh, I think, Dr. Terry, you want to say something about Japan. How do you how do you think there's something positive coming out of this? Okay, we have changed our stroke practice because of the uh, infection control. So some stroke centers, uh, sorry, most of stroke centers use MRI to triage stroke uh, diagnosis, but uh, some stroke centers change their uh, imaging priority from MRI to CT because CT is much easier to clean up after the uh, suspected COVID patient. So some change has happened. And we also need to reduce the newly COVID-19 patient number of COVID-19 is essential. So we are now approaching to the uh, politics and the government to uh, reduce our uh, uh, pandemic, uh, next pandemic. So we are approaching to the uh, polit uh, political issues as well. Uh, Ramesh, how is it um, done? Again, I can speak on, on based on my experience and I think what I've seen positive is that one those changes that were waiting on the sidelines to be implemented like my acute uh, inpatient um, stroke alert system that that's been done uh, I think that we are going to find that our MDTs run a little better with zoom and whatsapp 
uh, I know for sure that, you know, I, I like using telehealth for uh, outpatients. Um, it, it is a little impersonal at times, but again, it runs quite efficiently. Uh, acute stroke services, I think probably we might be able to streamline and sort of cut shave minutes off, which will ultimately hopefully lead to you know, um, better time to, to treatment. Ashraf, how about you? So similarly, I think uh, the, the most obvious one is basically telemedicine and telehealth. I think there's also answering question uh, called uh, from the Q&A. So yeah, uh, yeah it, it, maybe we will have the telemedicine uh, uh, call from uh, my hospital very, very soon. There's something very, very nice and we look forward to. Great. Khadija, you've talked about uh, tele-rehab. Anything else? Same as yeah, we are, we are, I mean, we need to work on tele, especially for our most uh, a quarter of our patient who have, we don't have rehab at all, even during pandemic time. So we need to focus on that. At least reach out for them. Uh, so uh, for uh, that's the thing. I think I'm more the quarters of patient. That, it, but this is actually uh, under reporting figures. I think this more than you can see over over Malaysia. <laughs> So I think two messages, right? Uh, we need to uh, innovate and uh, we need to apply political pressure. Politicians are not going to be handling this. Uh, thank you all so much for contributing to this fantastic webinar. I hope everyone stayed with us during the difficult we had. Thank you all. I'll see you again in the next webinar and uh, stay safe.